Hey guys, my name is Desmond and welcome to the Nice Guys channel. This is going to be the first of many doctrinal videos that I'll be making explaining what I believe and why I believe them through the scriptures. I pray that this edifies you and help you grow in your own faith. But of course, always have your Bibles ready and test everything I say by the scriptures, just as it says in Acts 17 verse 11 when it comes to Greens testing Paul. This video will be about eternal security. It's an important red button issue with most Christians, and it's one that I'd like to clarify in one video once and for all. Clearing up some misconceptions about the doctrine, and also answering a couple of rebuttals as well. So, without further ado, let's get into the video. Eternal security, also known as once saved, always saved, is the doctrine that teaches that once a person becomes a believer in Christ, they are eternally secure from the wrath of the Lord. Our key text today will be Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. So why is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14 such strong verses in favor of eternal security? You start with verse 1. Who is Paul speaking to? He is speaking to the saints who are in Ephesus, and then of course the general body of believers talking about the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now let's go down to verse 4. I'm just going to read a little bit of this here. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Who is us? He's speaking of the faithful in Christ. So he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven and places in Christ. So positionally, you are in Christ. If you are in Christ, this all pertains to you. It says, just as he chose us in him, talking about believers, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So let me stop there just for a moment. Now, of course, I'm not counting this. The way I would read this is that, he chose us in him, talk about position in those who are in, are in Christ. This is the group that he has chosen to inherit these blessings. So, he has chosen believers to be holy and blameless before him in love and predestined this group to be adopted as sons in Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ to himself. And it says further on, verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So I'm going to stop right there because I want to read the entire chapter here. You guys can do it on your own time. But basically, this is all pertaining to believers that all these promises hold to believers. And then he's predestined this group, uh, this group here to be sons. Now, can he undo the predestination that he has ordained? No. He has chosen believers to be this way. Unbelievers are not chosen to be this way. This is my view of predestination, of course, in this chapter. My countless friends will have fun with this, but this is not the point of this video. But let's go down a little bit further. All right, now this is where we get into verses 13 and 14. Now again, this is talking to the group of believers, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus, talking about if you're a Christian, he's talking about you. It says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I want to focus on this part right here, too. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? So, what does guarantee mean? It is a promise. God promises this group, talk about believers, He promises believers that we will have an inheritance until the redemption of a purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So there is a time frame too. This seal is effective 
off the till the day we bless you, God and God are sons and such to redeem us from this world. When we're with rapture from this world, we're going to be with the Father with reconciled. So let's start back over just really quick. Believers are, are promised these things by God. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what his son has done. It doesn't say about anything we have to do in order to keep that. Notice. And then the way we receive that is by trusting in him. Talk about Jesus Christ. We trust in Jesus Christ and we inherit these promises. And then the guarantee of that salvation is the Holy Spirit of promise that is sealing us until the day of redemption. That is why these two verses here are significant when we talk about eternal security. Another strong verse in favor of eternal security is one of our best known verses, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, why is that so important? Could you just stop believing and not have eternal life? Well, this is going to be multifaceted when it comes to explaining this. So I'm going to explain the first part, which is you have eternal life at the point of belief. Why do I say that? Let's go up to John chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel what I said to you, you must be born again. So we'll stop right there. First of all, what most people who oppose eternal security forget, or they just leave out, is that we are new creatures in Christ. We are born again. Can we but become unborn? Can we spiritually die again? Can the Holy Spirit leave us? That is rhetorical. No, no, and no. Once the Holy Spirit is in us, He consistently directs us. A true believer does not live in the consistent sin at all. But before I get into that, let's focus on this part. The fact that you inherit eternal life at the point of belief. Notice John chapter 3 verse 16. So I'm going to go down just a little bit more to 17. It says, For God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Remember, there's another verse in Corinthians where it says, There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But again, it says, But he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and the men love their darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates light, and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes into the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So again, those deeds are done because of belief in God. So notice that. Eternal life is not dependent at all on your works. Maintaining your salvation or maintaining your salvation is not dependent on that. All this is eternally secure in Christ and you have eternal life at the point of belief. Another strong verse would be Romans chapter 5, verse 1. But I'm going to read a little bit more just for context, of course. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just stop you just for a second. We have peace because we've been justified by what? By our faith. Not by our works, but by our faith. Verse 2, it says, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we stand in that grace through our faith and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit pours out His love, the love of God, in our hearts. And again, this is the same Holy Spirit that seals us. He's the one who has promised to us in John chapter 14. And of course, the text we read in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read just a little bit more. It says, For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. 
Yet perhaps for a good man, someone will even dare to die. Verse 8, But God demonstrates his love, his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not by our works that we do to maintain our salvation, but no, we're saved simply and only by his life. Verse 11, read one more. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So now we've been reconciled to the Father by his Son because of his death. None of this is maintained anywhere in this text by our works. So again, you apply everything we just talked about earlier. John chapter 3, verse 16, Ephesians chapter 1. You know, these texts are really strong evidences for eternal security. If we've been justified, that's all we need to be saved. And just to add this as well, the triune God, all three persons are involved in the securing of the believer. Let me start with this. The Father wills, John chapter 6 verse 39. The Son paid, 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. And the Holy Spirit seals, as we went over before in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. God is what seals and keeps the believer in Christ. There is no part in where we actually contribute to that. Now to the rebuttal section. Obviously, there's been a couple people on my channel that has spoken against eternal security, uh, namely Adam and Otis. Well, he hasn't come on my channel, but I have spoken to him within our group. Uh, they are staunch opponents against eternal security. And so this is also a response to them and their many videos against eternal security. Now, one of the main criticisms I've heard, especially from Adam, was that uh, eternal security is actually Gnosticism. This is incorrect. What the Gnostics actually believe is what they will call antinomianism. Anti meaning against and nom meaning law, so against the law. So they were antinomians. And I'm just going to read a couple examples here just to kind of give some more clarity to this. Um, the Manicheans held that their spiritual being was unaffected by the actions of matter and regarded carnal sins as being at worst forms of bodily disease. So the Manicheans believe that their spiritual being was unaffected by physical actions. The worst that can actually happen is that you may, be get, you may get sick. Other than that, there's no real consequence uh, to what you do. And so they actually disregard the Old Testament. Uh, Marcion de Sinope was the founder of Marcionism, which rejected the Hebrew Bible in its entirety. Marcion considered the God portrayed in the Bible to be a lesser deity, a demiurge. Uh, and he claimed that the law of Moses was contrived. So Demiurge basically saying that the God of the Bible is satanic, evil, because they view that matter was evil. So again, when it comes to uh, internal security and antinomianism, those are two completely different things. So internal security is not Gnostic. So we're going to go down and actually talk about what we actually uphold eternal security proponents we actually uphold the law we say the law is a good thing um, it's a schoolmaster to us uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 and if we let me also read this to you as well from first John first John chapter 3 verse 7 little children let no man deceive you he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So what is First John actually saying in chapter 3 here? 
All right, so it makes it clear that those who practice righteousness are of God. Let me point you to another verse as well. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said to them, If you love me, you will obey what I command. The way that you know someone is a true believer is that they obey what Christ says. So if someone is not following that, if someone is not truly of God, then they will not have the works to show for it. Works are important. They are what we are created for in Christ Jesus. Again, remember Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and not of our own selves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. All right, so that's the key thing here. We are saved by grace through our faith. However, once we've been born again, there are works that Christ has for us that we should walk in. So here's the thing about eternal security. Eternal security doesn't say you can do whatever you want. It says the complete opposite. Eternal security will actually state that someone who is eternally secure is known by the works that they do. Okay? Your, sal your works don't get you salvation. Your works shows your salvation. And here's another, here's another thing on top of that. We don't work because we're trying to maintain salvation. Just as in John chapter 14, verse 15, we work because we love him. Our works show forth our love for our Messiah. So I'll use an example. If you're married, you have a wife, you have a husband, you love them, right? Now you, you just imagine you don't do anything to show that you love them. How can someone say you truly love them? Your love that you have for your spouse will show by the actions that you do for them. Your actions isn't love. Your actions are a result of the love that you have. So let's go a little bit further as well. Let's go to James, James chapter 2. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. But someone will say, verse 18, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe in one God, you do well, even the de demons believe and tremble. So in James chapter 2, obviously this is one of the favorite verses for those who try to promote a works-based salvation. This is not actually promoting a work salvation. This is actually showing what a living faith looks like versus a dead faith. And what do I mean by that? A living faith, think of a tree. A tree should bear fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, it's a dead tree. And those dead trees, well, <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're going to be hewn down and thrown into the fire because they're not really alive. Those who are made alive in Christ, those who have been renewed by the Holy Spirit will live as the Spirit dictates. Those who do not are going to be cast aside. Now, we're going to go a little bit further into this. Uh, James also uses um, Abraham as an example. I'm going to compare that with what Paul says in Romans. In James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there before I go to 23. All right, so let's go to Romans 4. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father was, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. Notice that. He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, or for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Okay, so let's compare Romans chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 4, with James chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. Uh, these two scriptures here are actually perfectly in line with one another. So Abraham, he was justified before God 
by his faith. It was a credit to him as righteousness. Even James attested that as well. But for us, as he makes clear here in verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works? The point is, is that we are able to see the works of Abraham and know that he was a faithful man of God because, again, that's what was reported and that was shown. So if we, you know, if we look through James chapter 2, this is all about our faith working and showing. In Romans, this is talking about salvific here. We are justified by our faith alone. James is talking about our faith will produce works. If it doesn't, it is a dead faith. Paul would call us to re-examine ourselves and see that we are truly in a faith. How do you examine yourself? By looking at the works that you do. All right, what does your belief actually lie in? Does it lie in Jesus? And if it truly lies in Jesus, then it should produce. John chapter 14, verse 15, I'll repeat that again. If you love me, you'll obey what I command. So again, eternal security of uh, proponents does not say you can do whatever you want. That's not eat, nowhere taught when, when it comes to eternal security. What is actually taught is that true believers produce its fruit. False believers, false converts do not. And we, we would know that by the fruit that they bear. And I want to end off with this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. It says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. It is clear that those who leave Christianity, those who walked away, were never of Christ. As John makes it clear that these are antichrists, against Christ. If they were of us, they would have remained with us, and clearly they did not. So the idea that someone can walk away from their faith actually would show that they were never truly believers in Christ. The people who are against eternal security put so much stock in someone's claim, well, hey, I'm a Christian. Okay, where's the evidence of that? They don't ask for evidence, they just go by the claim. Those who support eternal security look for the evidence of a believer because there should be fruit that, that bears because the Holy Spirit with living within will produce fruit through that believer. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I just wanted to make a video on eternal security because I figured that was really important to get out. Um, but I do want to end off with these closing thoughts as well. We are secure in Christ and we have assurance that Christ has saved us and will keep us to the day of redemption because of his Holy Spirit. Also, let me read another verse to you in relation to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, keep watch over yourselves and the entire flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Christ is not going to lose anything that is covered with his blood. He purchased it. He's going to come back and redeem his promised possession. I'm um, going to read another one here. This is the second Corinthians chapter one, verse 22 placed his seal on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a pledge of what is to come. And what is to come? It is Christ, his kingdom, being reconciled with the Father in heaven. These things are coming and we're going to be there rejoicing in heaven. We're not going to stand before God and, and say, well, look what I've done right. No, it's about what his son, we're going to plead the blood of Christ over our lives. And that is what's going to save us. All right, let me also read a couple more. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Our redemption lies in his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses are according to the riches of his grace. He is so gracious to us because he knows we're going to mess up. But his son is there to forgive us of our sins. That's in 1 John chapter uh, 2, actually, verse 1. He is our advocate. He is our savior. He is going to forgive us of what we've done wrong. And we can trust in what he's done for us. If we are trusting in our works, we might as well just be like the Mormons. 
their ver their version of Ephesians is in their book of Second Nephi, where it says, "For by for by grace we are saved through faith." After all we can do, that is not biblical. What is truly known is what we stick in Scripture. Don't try to add all this extra stuff. You do what you're supposed to do by keeping things in context and reading what the authors actually intended to say by reading everything that they said. So look over those verses I've spoken about. Read them all. Look at the context of those. And please leave a uh, comment if you disagree. That's fine. Let's go ahead and have that discussion. Let's be Bereans, like it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And let's reason through scriptures together. All right, guys. God bless and thank you for watching. Thank you.